All right, and we are live. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Sean. It is so good to be back with you here today. Um, thank you all. I'm Courtney Garrett, President and CEO of Downtown Dallas, Inc. We're so thrilled to have over 250 of you here with us uh, for this portion of our series today. So far within the State of Downtown series, we've had a great market overview fueled by a lot of information from the phenomenal research team here at DDI. And just last week, we heard from Ray Washburn about his plans for the Dallas Morning News site. We had a lot of interest there and I think a lot of coverage coming out. We're gonna to continue to hear from more folks throughout the summer. A Couple of housekeeping items just to get us all started here. This program is being recorded and it will be provided to you after the session. We will email it and it will also be posted on our YouTube site. We will also be taking questions at the end of the program, so please go ahead and use that Q&A bar. Anytime a question comes to mind, be sure and type it in. And our great Chief Marketing Officer, Shalissa Perry, will be joining us at about 30 minutes in with some of the questions coming in from all of you. I know Sean's eager to hear from all of you as well as I. Now, to take us back to exactly why we are here, so much has changed in our world in such a short amount of time. And I think once every other day or so, we take a step back and, and we really think about that. And downtown has really been an epicenter of all of this impact. Yet at the same time, we know that the livelihood and the success of our city is dependent on downtown. We're the largest tax base, the largest employer. We've had the fastest growing residential population in the city for the last decade. We're the hub of our regional transportation system and our livability has absolutely been transformed with new parks, schools, services, and amenities that's really turned downtown from just that commercial office center into a true neighborhood. Downtown is really the place where all of Dallas can and should come together. So since March, DDI has been heavily focused on our field operations, while we've also been providing all of you and our stakeholders the most up-to-date information that you need in order to be able to do your business and make critical decisions during this very challenging time. Our downtown safety patrol and clean team are still out seven days a week. They're here to serve. If you don't have the See Say Now app on your phone, this is the little plug, be sure and download it in the App Store, and that'll give you direct access to our dispatch for both the Downtown Safety Patrol and the clean team. We've also recently resumed our homeless outreach services. So look for our homeless outreach managers out in their purple shirts. They have some new uniforms now, and they are out doing direct street engagement and making critical connections with our homeless population with service providers. We also have awarded over $84,000 in a storefront restoration grant program since June 1st, helping our small businesses to repair and revive their storefronts. And we've launched a business continuity program to help with our economic recovery in all of the important sectors that are here in downtown, from merchants to our large anchor corporations to our residential population, all of those who need help during this very strained economic time. So the goal of this series is really to take an in-depth look at those drivers of the downtown Dallas economy. We're gonna look at COVID market impacts, recovery strategies, and how we collectively ensure that growth and social equity remain balanced. We have $4 billion of active projects in the works today. That was the same as right before this pandemic started. We have some amazing, dedicated developers who are very optimistic about this market, realistic, but also optimistic. I think you'll hear that from Sean today. And they're continuing to be committed to downtown, to create jobs, to deliver services in retail, deliver housing, and really continue the revitalization of our urban core. So over the course of the summer, we're going to hear from many more of those people. We have Larry Daniels with HRI, who's going to be with us in our next session talking about the hospitality market. Mike Hoke will be with us to talk about his new park and So Good developments. We have Sarah Terry with Stream, a great expert on the commercial office market, and John Zog to follow that. Many more will come, so please stay tuned and we'll continue to announce this program all the way through September. 
So today, it is my absolute pleasure to be here with Sean Todd, a DDI board member, a downtown champion, and I'm very fortunate to say a very good friend. Uh, Sean, we're absolutely thrilled. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you where in the world you are, because that does not look like Dallas behind you. Now, I've had the honor of working with Sean since he started on his first project downtown 400 North Herve, the old historic post office building. And since then, we know his portfolio has expanded to include one Dallas center, now the East Quarter and the National. Really, Sean's passion and dedication to downtown has been something that's truly driven the revitalization over the last decade. So Sean, we're, we're very grateful for all that you do for downtown. Welcome. Let's go ahead and dive in. So first, tell us where you are and tell us why you're there because today is my anniversary of 15, oh. but I don't think I quite match where you no. are. Well, first off, thank you, Courtney and, and Shalissa and the whole DDI team. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with my partners and my teammates at Todd Interest and just for the kind words. So Cheryl and I will celebrate early part of next month, 35 years. But uh, I think the 103 degree heat last week prompted me to say, hey, there's a little spot in Mexico where it's 85 degrees. So we were able to sneak off, and, but we'll be sneaking back quickly to Dallas today. So it's been a nice respite to get away. Well, and I wanted to bring that up, one, to say congratulations, but two, I know family is such a big part of your business, and I know Cheryl has been a long-standing partner and supporter of everything that you do. Yeah. So where I'd like to start is really tell us how Todd Interest got started. You've been okay. in Dallas for 35 years. I think that makes you pretty much a native. Yeah. Uh, talk like one. So <laughs> let's hear a little bit more about how you built the company and how so much of what you do is family-driven. Yeah, so um, I grew up in a family business in Oklahoma that disappeared in the in the collapse of uh, uh, in the 1980s, and which frankly was probably the best thing ever for me. I would have gone back into a nepotistic world of um, just um, in a small town in Oklahoma, and I was very fortunate uh, to get out of Baylor and to get a job with a company by the name of Connell Development Company that uh, a Park City's uh, Dallas family. Uh, George Connell, his son, Mark, uh, who were just a family business that I would, I've tried to model our firm after. It was a family business comprised of many families and great integrity. Bill Foose, who was not related to the family, was the CEO and president. And just at a very young age out of college for five years, I, I used to tell everyone the day I started my first job is the day the real estate market collapsed. And I had the benefit of being around some very wise individuals that gave me uh, a lot of runway to work in a lot of different multifaceted things. I started off as director of marketing. Then I started off as a junior project manager. Then I started off running projects. And out of city hall in and out of public works in Jefferson. And I was very beneficial in an early age to see how the city worked and how the city functioned. And so you wind that 35 years forward. Um, listen, Ray, and by the way, Ray was phenomenal last week. What a great guy to, to start the show off with. So, um, I had to pay everyone to get on today. Ray had people that actually showed up to listen. But um, we are in a great city in America to develop in. We, we develop across the country, as you know. And um, if you're frustrated developing in Dallas, you're in a pretty myopic world in where you operate. We're a can-do city. Um, 1990 uh, is when I started Todd Interest. But what that really meant was I was fortunate enough to keep a job five years out of school and ultimately lost my job. And um, I was given a free office and uh, an engineer, one of Dallas's finest engineering firms, Nathan D. Meyer Engineers. And uh, Nathan, who, who passed away tragically many, many years ago, but Nathan gave me his last free phone line and his receptionist answered the phone, Todd Interest. And it was a time when um, I would go into savings and loans and close up banks and open up cardboard boxes and literally look at real estate deals as an opportunity to buy properties that were broken. And so we started there. We started buying a lot of land. I started going to high net worth individuals with my ideas and um, trusting that they had integrity. If they didn't, I didn't have a way to defend myself, but really went to them with a the context of, um, I don't care how we structure a deal, but um, here's, I just like to work for back end piece of participation and found a couple of gentlemen that believed in me. And we started buying really for the most part land uh, in far North Dallas and in Collin County. Interest rates dropped in 93, 94, and we started buying broken shopping centers around, around the Metroplex. 
and then really started expanding that into different parts of the country, into Tennessee, into Chicago, to uh, Wisconsin, um, and started learning value. Had a great banker, Bob Stone, who's, who's the head lending officer now over at Veritex Bank, and uh, which is a shout out for Veritex. But Bob was a guy that really believed in me. His young banker was a, his young assistant was a gentleman by the name of Trey Morsbach. And Trey's a pretty big deal here with JLL now, formerly HFF. And so you find that over time, you form great relationships with people, very much Courtney, like DDI. I mean, when we, uh, when we started buying broken shopping centers, a lot of single family development, 2006, seven, eight, uh, I started looking at downtown. And mainly because you could see the beginnings of goodness in 2007, we had what, 2000 people downtown maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could see though that, there was some initial excitement and DDI was, was beating the drum on the vanguard of, of creating the messaging of, Hey, this can be something really special. We were drawn to the post office, which was our first ever. Um, it wasn't our first ever adaptive re reuse deal. Uh, years ago, we did our first mall. Um, we called it demalling. And um, I remember I was interviewed by NPR back in the mid nineties and they were fascinated that you could take a 1950s mall and turn it inside out and still utilize part of the mall and add new parts to the mall. And this was long before the term adaptive reuse even began. But we started, the, the main central theme in what we do is we're looking for value. And, and one, in, in how our firm is established, we're entrusted with investing other people's money and we invest our money along with them. But if we're not providing value to our clients, then I don't know why we exist. But it just seems that we, we look for little real estate anomalies, I call it. We look for things that are kind of one iteration off of a certain bearing. And that led us to the post office, which was our first ever historical project where we did National Park. Our partner in that project was Chevron and, and Mariah, who, who's been just, that was our first project together. I'm actually here with today. As far as how family came into play, you know, you're a little bit of an accordion. You expand when the market's good and, and, and you try to hold on to everyone you can when the market's challenging. And when you start in the land business, which is where I started, um, you, you really can't do land and carry a big, big staff because the you, you assets trade once every three years, maybe, or every two years. And so hopefully that early prudency in buying land has helped us keep the firm together. We've, um, we've got 16 individuals in our company now. I bet the average age is probably 28 or 30. And it's been fun to see the many young families, many of which have come from real estate families in Dallas that have joined our firm. And culture is a big part of it. We're big on transparency. We're big on being quick to forgive. We're big on saying, I made a mistake. And uh, we're big on saying, um, the world's your oyster. Here's your opportunity. The the 20 somethings that are now 30 somethings really lead out in our city. Um, it's been fun to have my two sons join, you know, they had their own careers in other places and um, it's work. When you have a family business, you have to work on it every day because those, those, um, those lines of father, son and business partner. Um, and so that's been a blessing to get to work on that. And it's been a joy, but it takes a lot of work. Um, and then we have several dynamics as well within the other young uh, members of our team uh, a lot of went to school together. Some of them went to college together. Some of them were best friends in college. But it's been great to see how they process life together. And, and really for me, Courtney, you say 35 years, it's been great to see how little I do now. And, and that's different. Uh, if you keep your hand on the steering wheel, you're going to ultimately run the car in the ditch. And uh, it's been fun to see uh, this next generation of, of leaders, what they're doing in our city. Well, and I think, I mean, that's actually a, a perfect segue. I want to come back to those complicated projects when we talk about the national and a little bit more. Okay. But I really, the day that you and Patrick came into my office with this idea for the East Quarter, I think really demonstrates what you're talking about. And so I want to shift over to that development a bit because it really, I mean, I think if I was looking back, I was trying to remember exactly I think it was probably about four years ago. I think it was maybe 2016 when you all walked into my office and said, you know, we have this crazy idea. And you rolled out a map and started pointing to the buildings that you thought that you could assemble. So take us from the moment of 
gosh, this might be a good idea to what you're doing now, which is an entirely new district being built on what was kind of a sleepy edge of downtown. Yeah. Well, um, it would be the old adage, I couldn't see the forest for the trees, <laughs> but um, Patrick could. And I think to a great degree, you know, many of us had driven by the beautiful Magnolia building where, where Nick Metavides will have his new restaurants and said, what an iconic building, because it had the great turn of the century, 1910, just unique architecture. But absent that, you just were going by a building. And um, the previous owner was a very talented individual that um, assembled a remarkable group of the initial buildings, but he was very proud of them from a financial standpoint. And he should have been very proud of them. He had assembled something quite remarkable. But where the, the synergies come together when we looked at uh, the initial holdings that we knew we could acquire, we realized, you know, let's make this bigger. And that's about the time we sat down in your office and said, hey, hey, could we create a truly walkable, all these buzzwords that urbanists say, can we truly do that in one dynamic? And so that took about three years to assemble from, I think, eight different owners. Uh, I remember the, um, the old nightclub purgatory going in with Patrick and Stephanie in our office and, and, and just seeing Stephanie's face like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do here? And now I see 2200 Main and how it's completed um, and how taking that building and opening up that western wall that didn't have glass previously of an automobile manufacturing plant and seeing the skyline in, our, in, in the backdrop in the forefront of that. And now to have that walkability all done with private dollars, but quite frankly, Courtney, all done under those that went before us, which was the 360 plan that laid that in place. It, it gave us signaling to what the city council, Councilman Medrano, uh, before Councilman Medrano, the previous council, you know, Angela Hunt was very involved in that front, as you well know. Um, and to see now how East Quarter, um, we've completed those initial buildings. I think we have 18 initial historic buildings that have been repurposed, many of them released on long-term leases. And to see now the streetscape coming in uh, we just, the, the city called us up and said, hey, um, we'd like to see if you participate in resurfacing commerce. And the question was absolutely under one condition. We want you to incorporate a bike lane to connect Deep Ellum. And, um, you know, seeing how the pieces are coming together now has been great. The new build part of East Quarter is uh, equally fantastic. I mean, I look at Fletcher Cordell and, and, and Ben Davis and Jackie at CBRE and just their knowledge of, uh, you and I were talking early, Courtney, about the CBRE report that recently came out on technology yeah. yesterday. Um, I don't understand it all, but I know that our, our leasing executives do, but it's really good for Dallas. And when I look at who's in East Quarter now, and I look at some of our most cutting edge technology companies, and, and I go in Dialexis space, one of my gear space, and I go, goodness gracious, this is amazing, and see the talent that they're attracting. That talent wants to be a part of redemptive ennobling architecture. They want to walk out and go to Deep Ellum or walk across the street to one of our food and beverage establishments. And, you know, people say, what are you doing, Dallas? You eat, you drink, and you work, okay? And you go to the arts. It's not like we have a big lake. It's not like we have the mountains or an ocean or a stream. And Dallas is about the people. I look at our new build in 300 Maine, or excuse me, in 300 Pearl. We've got 336 apartments, 200,000 feet of office, and, you know, you think of this COVID mind frame, this was not even obviously in our mind frame, but you have 200,000 feet of office that you drive your car up to and you never have to get on an elevator if you don't want to. Several of those floors, you walk right into your space or you walk a half a flight up or half a flight down. And we did something very unique and very different. We, we opened up basically a, a rectangle, a square rather than created two rectangles with unencumbered views of downtown. I look at that space and I look at the dynamics of creating um, our new private lounge, private club for the office residents of East Quarter. Well, Harlan Crow started that when, when, when Harlan took his Crow campus and created you know, the Green Dragon. And you have that same similar dynamic, but very much in a cutting edge 2020 uh, presentation. Uh, so you take this new architecture that we're building half of our density we had no setbacks. We recognized setbacks. And um, you look at this new architecture with the old architecture and you see what happens with our 25,000, actually 40,000 feet of retail. It's pretty exciting. So uh, it took time. It took vision. It took a great partner. 
uh, JP Morgan, uh, our same partnership and that partnership with JP Morgan um, is in Chicago, is in Miami and Woodwood. And this partner of ours understands what urban life is all about. And so, you know, farmer market has been thriving. Uh, the new ownership in Deep Ellum, you've got deep pocketed focused owners. Look at what Joe's doing with Westdale and that team. Goodness gracious, how exciting. The Kempton, I think, has opened up or getting ready to open. Uh, I'm confident the apartments will do exceptionally well. That uh, was a fee development deal by Streetlights for, for Westdale. Uh, and Joe and his team are visionaries. So what you looked at, what I couldn't see the forest for the trees, now you can see it. You can drive through the forest, but more importantly, you're walking through the forest. So uh, it's been very exciting. Yeah, and our, our clean team shop is based right there where your construction's going on. So I can vouch for the fact that you are blowing and going on that project. It's phenomenal. Yeah, we'll open up the office retail will open in May of 2020. And, you know, kind of the icing on the cake, how thankful all of us are for what Parks for Downtown Dallas has done. And we've been able to be a small part in that and uh, some of the initial planning and the contributory premise. But to walk out your office door, I look at Pacific Park downtown when we did One Dallas Center. And now look at Pacific Plaza today. It's amazing. And look at the, look at the people using Pacific Plaza. It's very neighborhood focused. And we see Harwood Park being the park, obviously, for East Quarter, obviously the park for Farmers Market. And you all have friends that live there. Many of your team lives there. Many of our, some of our teammates live in that area. And you, you're seeing now, hey, in two years, three years, this is all going to be uh, very pedestrian oriented and very urban. Yeah. Well, and I think I wanted to put a little exclamation point on something you said earlier, which is, is related, and that's your belief and dedication and your help with the 360 plan. And for those tuned in who maybe aren't as familiar, the 360 plan is our strategic plan for downtown. And DDI has been the steward of that since 2011, and we continue to update it along with several partners uh, within the downtown and with the city. And I, I am grateful for developers like you, Sean, who truly understand the importance of comprehensive planning and looking at those collective visions and looking at really how we all want to see downtown move forward and helping that to inform your projects. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, another one of the priorities coming out of the 360 plan is adaptive reuse, historic preservation. We know your passion for preservation. Now, the National is a project that maybe this wasn't the first time you've looked at it. So I love this story as much as you're willing to share with everyone listening in. Um, tell us how the National came to be um, a part of, of what you're bringing forward and what we're gonna see. Well, um, self control is a big thing and a really good thing. And uh, when you have partners and uh, within your office, when out of your office that are willing to challenge you and your thoughts and ideas, um, a wise man once says iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. And uh, when the national, when we uh, was not called the national, then it's been 14 to one M for many, many years, obviously uh, an iconic building. When I rolled into Dallas in 1985, that was the epicenter of activity. And that bank lobby, which is now will be for us an 18,000 square foot ballroom with 30 foot windows on three sides. But it was, it was a vibrant hub. It, it was a hub of commerce in our city. It was a hub of industry. Uh, those pinstripe black and white, um, which will soon light up, very, very soon light up again. Um, but as downtown began to grow, uh, that property was very challenging. And Courtney, as you well know, it, um, there were a lot of people that um, lost a lot economically and I'm sure a big part of their life on that. Several years ago, it went into bankruptcy by a gentleman out of New York and um, we bought a lot of things out of bankruptcy. And I remember going back and forth to New York, my, my partner, Todd Brown, I said, Todd, I, let's, let's jump in on this. And he said, I'm game. And, but the price at bankruptcy got, we felt like it was just a little too pricey. We felt like the vision wasn't there completely. And um, individual ended up acquiring it. Uh, who's now our partner. We're very thankful that he's part of our partnership. But we were able to step into what has now been named the National at a point in time where um, it was going to fail and it was going to fail forever. Uh, there's obviously TIF money related to it. There's federal and state tax credit dollars related to it. And all for good reasons. The TIF money's there because the valuation of the building, it was a blight on our city. 
And uh, when you buy something that's 1.4 million square feet that was built in 1965 is the tallest building west of the Mississippi River. And you attempt to repurpose that property today. And when I say repurpose, not only in usage, but in every aspect from mechanical, electrical to plumbing, to bring a building up to 2020 standards, uh, it costs money. And it's challenging and it costs money because it's not designing from a fresh set of plans. So we were able to step in. We have a great lender in Starwood, which is the Stern family um, out of, out of uh, New York City, Starwood Property Trust. And we've got great partners in our tax mitigation, Stonehenge, uh, state tax credit investor. The tax mitigation arm for Warren Buffett is our federal investor. Then Mariah, who has been an investor in our many, many, many deals, started with the post office that truly understand the complexities of what's involved in something such as that. Um, it's probably without question been the most rewarding project I've ever been a part of because it's so mentally challenging and intriguing. Uh, I tell people that it never sleeps and it's always hungry. And a lot of that is geared around uh, the time frames for year end completion relative to the tax credits and the TIP monies that we didn't set those, those were set previously. And that's, that's a lot to digest just in and of itself. We bought this property a year ago, April. Um, frankly, we wouldn't have purchased it unless Andrews Construction was a part of it. Um, we're, we're very blessed to have a great relationship with Warren and Wade Andrews, Wayne Wilson, who's their senior vice president that's, that's on the job site himself personally. And you have to have someone, if you look at who's done more adaptive reuse projects in our city, it's without question, Andrews Construction. And I know you know, know Wade well. And Wade and, and his team have a passion for preservation. But then you've also got to have a remarkable architect. And, um, you know, when you think of Milton Anderson and Jerry Merriman and Amy Sanborn, uh, the younger partner in that firm, that understand the complexities of um, what preservation means and I'm not going to say rules because that can seem restrictive, but just the guidelines that are put in place to preserve things that are redeeming and redemptive. Um, it's complex in a financial structure. Uh, it's complex in execution. Uh, we're excited about our uses. The, um, just to have over 300 multifamily apartments that start on floor 22 and go up to the 48th floor, so it will be the tallest high-rise luxury apartments in our city. And when you take those apartments and you inherit this massive ninth floor podium structure, you're given a lot of space. And when you're given a lot of space, you're able to take time to take the really ennobling historic architecture and some of the accoutrements and incorporate that interior architecture into something with new design that provides a lot of amenity for our residents. And so, you know, I think of these times we've been through with COVID and set COVID aside, but to be in a place that offers you um, a wide spectrum of things to do and you never have to leave your property, is we're pretty excited about that. Then you take a 219 room Thompson Hotel. Um, we're so thrilled with our Thompson leader, leadership with Steve and Abby. Steve Shern is, is our um, general manager. Steve opened the Thompson Chicago, the Chicago Athletic Club. He ran the Beekman in, in New York City for several years. And he's been with us now for about a year here in Dallas. Uh, Abby, his right arm in sales and marketing, who uh, is a Dallas native, uh, who knows Dallas well. We're staffing now all of our senior positions. We have a great chef, young chef in the Jeremy Robinson, who is remarkable. And we are so excited. We have two main primary venues on the ninth floor and the 10th floor that we'll soon be announcing the naming of those venues and, and what that looks like to our city. We'll have the largest outdoor deck space uh, on the 10th floor of our building that just is remarkable. And to showcase that in our city, that's what big metropolitan cities have. You know, I love going to New York because I love the rooftops. I love to see the city. And, and Dallas has that in a couple of microscopic instances. And now we're going to have that in a large presentation format. Um, we have executed a lease. We'll be talking about it soon on the 49th and 50th floor. Um, with um, the two-star Michelin chef that uh, this is a firm that's, that's known throughout our country. And um, this is a great restaurant tour that will do something remarkably special with the 50 floor observation deck. Now that 50 floor is going to be programmed um, into a food and beverage opportunity for everyone to be a part of. And so the building's active. And um, then you find a great, uh, a great new partner in downtown Dallas to take over 25,000 feet in our building. 
uh, and retail on the street front. We're really excited about that building. Well, and it's, it's near and dear to our hearts at DDI because, yes, we are moving our, as I call it, our world headquarters where I sit today at the top of Bank of America Plaza, which has been a beautiful space for us, but we'll be moving in to the national um, sometime before the end of the year, which is really exciting for us. But that project is also our last vacant building of any significance to be done downtown. And by way of comparison, those who may be newer to the market, uh, in 2002, we had 40 vacant buildings. And Sean, basically your entire portfolio in downtown Dallas has contributed to that. So pretty incredible story. Um, now, in about the middle of what you were saying, you said, let's set COVID aside. Well, let's bring COVID back from the side for a minute. And let's talk about where we sit in the market today. Because sure. you're talking about a project where you're going to see pre-leasing starting on apartment units and you're opening a hotel and Construction crews are flying, but we're also in the face of some very uncertain times. So talk about, is that affecting your projects? And if so, how? And then what you see on a national level, knowing that you are active in other markets and how that maybe contrasts with what's going on here. Yeah. Well, the question is, yes, it's absolutely affecting our projects. And, you know, I talked earlier about just our firm and, um, Iron does sharpen iron. And so it has created daily, often minute and hourly collaboration as to, oh my, I never knew this would ever happen. And you get a lot of those. Um, and if you've got great relationships, um, it can be stressful, particularly when you have time. And I talk about the national, when you have time frames and timelines. Um, COVID has obviously been a, a tragic um, it's been tragic in many instances in people's lives. Um, in other people's lives, it's, it's been a, a disruption. But life goes on, right? And uh, anyone in this industry, you're not in the real estate business if you're, not, um, if you're not a believer in that life goes on and that there's opportunity. So you grab your bootstraps and you pull yourself up and you have very sober conversations often about how do we address this problem today. And so the joy in that for me has been seeing you know, the Jameson Berry Hills and the Tara Howards and our senior managing director, Jonathan Haywood, um, work with our contractors and our architects, solving challenges that we never thought would enter into our business life on a daily basis. From distribution channels being interrupted to workforces going from 550 people a day to 100 people a day, to uh, delivery of goods and services, uh, to establishing uh, over and above and beyond what the state and OSHA would require with respect to healthiness on a job site. Um, then just to dealing with the sensitivity to how do we work in a COVID environment on a job site and um, people that don't feel comfortable leaving their home that, um, but yet have a job to do. And then working as a firm during lockdown all of us working from home and just the dynamics that that creates. I, I remember laughing, you know, Cheryl, you know, all these Zoom calls when COVID was initially here and we're all busy, we're getting in our groove and I would look up and here's my lunch and here's a cup of coffee and here's an iced tea. And I remember sitting down for dinner one night, just sitting in my chair and Cheryl goes, hey, I'm not your flight attendant. And it's, it's just like, <laughs> you just realize that it's just so different, right? And, yeah. and we don't have young children at home and we don't have – both spouses working at home. But I think through that, what we've tried to do, and, and I'm really proud of Patrick and Phillip's leadership and Jonathan's leadership in this arena, of letting our team know that work is just work. It's not life. And it has its place, but it should never define us. And it's frustrating when you're so used to accomplishing things. And I think of moms that work and now moms are working and they're at home and they're a full-time mom and they're working and you've got spouses there and schedules continue. And so we've tried to be a good listener. We've tried to be a great encourager. Um, we've tried to be grace giving and, and we've received that back in multiple fold to us. Um, so, you know, it's been challenging and, you know, from an economic point, you know, I get asked often, when you're opening a hotel, are you going to open your hotel? You know, what's happening with your apartment building? You know, you get those questions nonstop. 
And, and sometimes if you're not a mature adult, you can feel that those questions are, are maybe dressed to be a little punitive and they're not. People are just curious. But mm -hmm. if you've been in the battle every day and you're battle worn every day, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like I don't want to hear the chatter. And uh, we will open this year. We're very excited. To, to, again, our leadership team at Thompson is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And we're, we feel very blessed with our city. I mean, we started the national just because of the time frame, sitting down with Chris Swackert and Magid Al Gaffrey and all of their respected teammates and said, said, look, we just, this is a big project. We're, we're not asking for any favors. We just want you to know that just for us to meet our, our inspection time frame. here's how many inspection hours are involved in this. And then you throw, you know, the disruption of COVID into the city municipal government life and what they've been challenged with. And they have been a remarkable, unbelievable responsive partner to our entire city in making things work. And I would submit that you won't find that in many cities. We have a project in Virginia that's just, Phillips running a large development force there and um, it's challenging and it's not a fraction of the execution capability of what's required here. So it's, um, we're a believer in the future, Courtney. I, I'm going to ramble for a second, but you know, we get asked a lot about office space and COVID. Well, I'm going to tell you this, the success story of Uptown is remarkable. I, I would put it in one of the top 10 of my career, but Uptown's absorbed and look at, at how successful as a building owner and the quality of what's built in Uptown. And then you take this little engine that was trying and couldn't do it and now it's done it in downtown and look at the quality of life and, the, and the, all the urban aspects. And we led their city last year in office absorption all across the Metroplex. Look at where that was 10 years ago. Look at the corporations that have come to downtown Dallas. Look at the, you know, when we did one Dallas center, for a brief moment that obtained the highest rents in our city. But what we offered was so dramatically more than what you could get from a ground up building. I look at the national people are going to be blown away with the level of finishes in these apartments, because when you buy something and you get the incentive that's so needed and you have all this space, you've got to create something remarkable and the value of downtown if I'm an office tenant and if COVID has created uh, contraction, then I'm going to go to places that have great parking. I'm going to go where there's a three per thousand. And, and I know parking is, and I'm, I'm not a bad guy for saying parking. Look, cars are reality in Texas. Okay. I'm as urban. My sons and I are as urban as anybody. Okay. Um, I've got a scooter and it scares my wife when I drive it. Okay. We own something called Mokes now. Okay. We have these Mokes that drive around East Quarter and they're remarkable, but um, parking is still a factor and East Quarter has three to three per thousand parking. It's a big deal for large corporations. But when you look at rental swings at the national and you look at rental swings downtown, when downtown is 50% less in overall economic base, and you see the quality of life downtown and we're already, we were already seeing that. That's why we led the Metroplex. But I think from downtown's perspective, if corporate America says, listen, we figured out some of our workforce can, can work from home. And I, and I don't think that's as easy an argument for someone in corporate America to make because we were made to be together as a people in all of us that have been working from home. We all want to get back together and we want to get to back together soon. But if corporate America says we're going to contract to a certain degree and thus you've got, a need for less space, or you have a focus from an economic recovery perspective that you want to be in more affordable space and not diminish quality of life, downtown's going to explode. And, and, and you look at the buildings downtown that have been so well done and you've seen the absorption, it was already ignited and was very catalytic. So I think with respect to COVID, you're going to see people that say, I can get equal and even better product for half the rental rate. And you're seeing that already. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you hit on it because that's really been something that you and I have talked a lot about. Um, you know, it's really finding opportunities in this challenge and our belief. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad you went there because that's really where I wanted you to end before we go to questions. It's that that sense of optimism in the market, again, very informed optimism. I don't think it's naive optimism. 
uh, you know, you are active in other markets, you're seeing what's happening. And the fact that we do have an opportunity here to position downtown and the importance of doing that for the entire city is something that we talk about a lot too. The importance of the tax base, the importance of providing jobs here as the job center in how we recover as a city. So I think we're, we're very liked mind there, like minded. Um, Shalissa, I see we have a few questions. So at this point, Sean, you're such an easy interview. I, I just get to kind of sit here and nudge you along. Um, so we're already at 1040. So we've done this a time or two together, Courtney. I know, I know. I just wind you up and you go. It's fantastic. Um, Shalissa Perry, our chief marketing officer, has been looking over your questions. So Shalissa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, this is all wonderful information. We've got a few good questions. I don't think we'll make it to all of them, but um, one from Greg Krause uh, regarding the East Quarter. Sean, can you talk about the street level infrastructure that you incorporated in the East Quarter with the wide sidewalks, bike lanes, fewer car lanes, and discuss ideas for creating momentum to incorporate that further into the CBD and Deep Ellum um, for an intentional, cohesive way to better connect the community? Yeah. Great question. Good morning, Greg. Um, so, again, back to the 360 plan, and you look at walkability and connectivity. And we felt it was tantamount to use private dollars and incorporating over $3 million of wider sidewalks, working within the city's context, and, and DDI led on this, and taking a lane of traffic out of Commerce Street. Uh, Ray talked about this last week. You know, we, we're, we're getting better on how we move traffic around downtown, but I'm glad to see Pearl Street being changed to north-south. But the street level improvements, uh, just the, downtown is safe. Without question, it's safe. But as, we, as we've added more people, it feels more and more safe. And when you have street lights, uh, we're incorporating in some public art that you'll be seeing in East Quarter soon. And it's quality art. It's not what I call cheap developer art. And you're going to see things at the street level. Uh, we've got a bocce ball court, and we've got a we've got an East Quarter Cup for bocce. And pre-COVID, we have um, many of our tenants that on a Friday afternoon, East Quarter sponsors a keg of beer, and um, and it was fun to see these men and women out taking a break and playing bocce. And it's those quality of life things that if other developers, um, you know, in our neighborhood, we were the only one that contributed to, to any of these costs. And, you know, I look back at how our city was built and it takes investment by the private sector, not the public sector. If we always rely on the public sector, we're never going to get there. It's not geared to do that. You can't charge enough tax base and, and the taxes that are there, frankly, in, 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 in this whole context where our world is today, a lot of these tax dollars need to go to places that they haven't ever been to before. That, that's been shameless in what's happened with some of our tax revenue. So Greg, thanks for the question, but we believe that connectivity will spawn more and more street front life. And um, we, we think these spokes of the wheel are all gonna be very intertwined here very soon when, when uh, our Pearl Street development opens up uh, here in about six months. Thanks, Sean. Uh, another good question from Robert. Um, thank you for the donation to the park that will be at your front door. He's talking about Harwood Park, um, and you all just announced a very generous donation to Harwood Park. Um, how long after you open will the park open? I guess just basically on the timeline of when that Harwood Park plans to open. Yeah, so we're really, thank you, Robert. Listen, what Parks of Downtown Dallas have done for our city and it's um, as more and more corporations, it's been remarkable with our leasing team. When you see what, what Fletcher and Ben and Jack are doing and you bring these corporations down into East Quarter, they get it now. They can go to Pacific Plaza and see Pacific Plaza and they go, you mean we're going to have one of these right in Farmer's Market and in East Quarter? And so parks are a significant part. Now, the city, the city of Dallas has to do their part. The city of Dallas, this should be the biggest layup for the park board, for uh, each of our council members. Look at this remarkable gift of over $30 million from the Below Corporation that ultimately created Parks for Downtown Dallas from the Deckert family to be the initial funding for these five parks. So Harwood, Harwood should be up and completed within inside of two years. But that's going to be dependent on monies from the bond program 
to be matched with the monies that have already in the land that's already been assembled. So in, in city leadership has done a good job on this. Um, I got a little discouraged over the last, and I'm, I'm glad the way where things ended up, all this debate that we had about 345 and what was happening under 345. Why was Carpenter Park ever even a part of that conversation? It just should have been a real layup to pull that apart and say, fund this darn park. And so parks are a big part of it. Uh, listen, in, in the donation part, that's, um, <clears throat> that was easy to do. We've got great partners in East Quarter. It's something that Patrick and Philip and I felt very passionate about doing, and our whole firm did. Uh, Tara lives in the neighborhood. Vanessa lives in the neighborhood. We have people in our firm. Adam Krause lives downtown. We're not just a firm that's um, operating within downtown. We're a firm that's living and working and believes in downtown, and it will not happen. The success we're happening won't continue without parks being at the precipice at the peloton of what's happening. Thank you. Okay, I think maybe one more. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, um, and going back to uh, some of the concerns with COVID um, from uh, D. Alex John, thank you for joining this morning. Um, mm -hmm. Sean, do you have any concerns regarding returns for luxury products uh, like the National given the recent downturn due to COVID, um, particularly long-term effects? And can you speak to your resolve when so many others are taking steps back nationally? Well, I think new projects are going to, uh, are obviously going to the short term going to be challenged. Uh, having said that, I think that projects that provide value, look, our banks have been healthy. Um, let, let's look, COVID wasn't a economic recession. COVID wasn't, um, COVID's impacted the whole world. And um, I'm not going to get into different perspectives on COVID, but we're a believer that the world will, um, will get back in place. The timing when that happens, I'm sure every 200 people in this call will have a different perspective, but I can only speak to what we're given stewardship over. Um, I heard the term luxury. Um, you know, there's a place for everything um, if you have everything in the right place. And the positioning with respect to the national, we think everything is in the right place. A big part of that particularly is that we're going to offer so much amenity within that building and then to have a building that has hotel amenities, to have a building that uh, if you're in your apartment and you want room service brought up to your room or you want uh, uh, maid service at your, your disposal, to have your own curated dog park um, within a building that's operated that you don't have to take your puppy to doggy daycare, you can do that on site now. Um, all the different amenities that are there to be able to have your own grocery store on site. I mean, one of the great things having a Thompson Hotel brand uh, let us do your shopping for you to be able to click on your app and have your groceries delivered through our procurement, through our hotel, delivered directly to your room. So again, luxury to me, I would equate to quality. Um, is there going to be a new 70 story tower built today? That's luxury apartments. Probably not, but I wouldn't say that's COVID related. I would say that our market was pretty full on that product already. Are you going to see product that um, is unique? and has differentiation that investors are going to invest into? Absolutely. The capital markets are here, the capital markets are healthy, but they're going to invest in this time frame with proven partners, with someone that's finding value in this present state that we're in. So, you know, what does a hotel look like in today's world? Well, I can't look at occupancies of hotels in general, but I can look at the story of downtown and I know how thriving our downtown was. Is the convention business going to be back? Uh, this January? Probably not. So we'll be doing some things at the National, at the Thompson, that we'll be announcing that I think people will go, wow, what a cool idea. Because you've got to, um, you, the world, you heard me say it earlier, the world's your own oyster. you got to take a little grain of sand and you got to create a pearl. And we're constantly thinking about how can we create different ways of revenue for our property, for our investors, to add tax base to the city, and to create vibrancy. Um, we love, love our position right now. None of us like what's happened in the world, but we're very positive with total sobriety and good accountability in how we're moving forward with the national. Uh, we're excited about our apartments and we're very excited about uh, the whole project. Well, and I, I think that in and of itself really represents everything that we've heard from you this morning, Sean. And I think the dedication that you have to these complex projects is exactly 
what it will take to get us through this recovery period. Uh, you know, I, I think it's very interesting because with you, we hear so much about quality of life, about livability, about connectivity, um, you know, about preservation of these projects and economics is the subheader. And I, I think that's why your projects have been so instrumental in the revitalization of town towns. So thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for all that you do for DDI, all that you do for downtown and uh, safe travels. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Thank you. Uh, and we look forward to having you back in town here very shortly. So if we could have a virtual applause for Sean, thank you so much for joining us. A few closing comments here from me. Next event will be on July 30th with Larry Daniels, again with HRI. Larry will be talking to us about the hospitality market. Uh, we will also then have Mike Hoke, as I mentioned before. He's gonna give us an update on the New Park project as well as So Good in the Cedars. And then we'll be followed by Sarah Terry and John Zog. So be sure and tune in for those. I can't let everyone go without talking about DDI membership. We fully recognize that this is a very challenging time. We also really want to reiterate the importance to our organization as a nonprofit, the support that we get. Many of you on this call are members. Those of you who aren't, I would encourage you to talk to me directly or to any of our fellow members. Sean, you've been a great advocate. I know you've talked to anybody about the importance of this organization. Um, and when we rely on that membership support to do what we do, to provide our services and to be able to speak from a public policy perspective on behalf of downtown. So please reach out to us to learn more. Uh, I think you'd be connected with some great peers as well. Also be sure and sign up for our email list if you're not already at downtowndallas.com and follow us on social media for the latest on everything from market updates and development updates to what restaurants are open and closed to some things that you can get out and do, discover our parks, discover our trails, and all of the really important critical information that changes from day to day. We do have a COVID-19 resource page available on our website that is available with a lot of resources for small businesses, for residents. It's very comprehensive and will help guide you through this process. And finally, our state of the market report, which is where we opened this series, is now up on our website and we are updating that monthly. And that report is driven by the research team here at DDI. It looks at a very micro scale on what's happening downtown and it is intended to help you be able to better plan your business. So please take a look at those publications. Sean, any last words for our audience today before we sign off? Uh, thanks to all of you for being a part of this this morning. And, and Courtney, just uh, you have the DDI membership. Uh, everybody step up to the plate. If you're listening, you're not a member. Uh, it's easy to do. And uh, DDI has been on the, the cutting edge for how many years now, Courtney? How many years uh, did DDI? At, yeah, over 60 years. Yeah. And it will continue to be in the vanguard. So thank you for your leadership and your whole team. It's a joy to be a part of, of what you all are doing. Yeah. Thank you for the Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. Again, thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you in our next session. Have a wonderful day.